Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Catherine Young. Of the Backyard Honey Company. And also BackyardBeekeeperSupply.ca. This was such a fun and fascinating conversation about beekeeping and honey. You'll notice Marshall and I don't speak very much during this episode, and that's because we were totally enthralled with what Catherine had to teach us today. Yeah, so come on in, Catherine. <laughs> Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Do you enjoy Bond Park Podcast? If so, we would really appreciate it if you leave a review, like, rate, subscribe, but most importantly, share directly from the platforms with your family and friends. That's the best way to get the word out to everybody and more people will get to see our show that way. So click those like buttons and share our show. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) On with the show. This is it. Bond Park is supported by the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. The market is a community landmark of more than a half century and is the largest year-round farmer's market in Canada. Whatever you crave, you'll find it there. There's country classics like fresh apple fritters, cinnamon rolls, and Oktoberfest sausage on a bun. And new favorites like corn-wrapped vegan tamales, Greek gyros, and blooming onions. With almost 300 food and artisan vendors on site, there's something for everyone, and it makes for a great day trip with family or friends. The St. Jacob's Market is open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays during the summer. Stay up to date on hours and events by following the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market on Facebook, Instagram, or at stjacobsmarket.com. And here's a word from summer. I love going to the market with my family. There's so much to see and do. I love trying all the different foods, and it's a great tradition for our family. Catherine Young, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And we're Happy very excited to talk to you. <laughs> I say this all the time, but I truly mean it. Yeah. Marshall and I love this project, and we absolutely love meeting our neighbors and people in our community. And I'm fascinated by bees and beekeeping. Same. Yeah. So I want to know how you guys met. Right. So um, Catherine actually is was one of our sponsors, Backyard Honey. And uh, before I sit down and write the script for one of our sponsors for the ad that you read for us, Sarah... Um, Sometimes I chat with them a bit. So I had this little conversation with Catherine on the phone, and it must have been a minute into the phone call. I thought, wow, this is great. <laughs> this would make for both a great podcast like, um, and also uh, an article in the War of the Chronicle. So we're talking, I'm listening, and I kind of cut her off, and I said, hold on. <laughs> Can I write a story about Backyard Honey for the Chronicle? And Catherine said, yeah. And it was kind of like, well, let's just keep chatting then. And then I could totally imagine this being a podcast because I'm just fascinated by this. And uh, there's another level level we're going to talk about with regards to health benefits of of beekeeping. And um, I thought, uh, well, let's turn this into a podcast episode. And that's what we're going to do today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Catherine, can you uh, let's kick it off with telling us some. I, I, I kind of know the story already, but let's start off with uh, how you and your husband got into beekeeping. It's a bit of an odd story. Most people get into beekeeping because they want honey or they're interested in pollination or all those reasons. Uh, My husband actually read a book called Beekeepers Don't Get Arthritis. And we have no idea how we came upon the book. We don't have it anymore. It came out of the ethers and disappeared back in. And he's had chronic back pain for many years since an injury when he was a teenager increasingly dealing with you know what kind of pharmacological options are out there this book came along and he said let's get two hives neither of us any any background in this sort of thing and so we took the course at the university of guelph and uh, that teaches beekeeping and we started off and that was 2012 2013 and now we have 48 hives so we got into what's called bee venom therapy so it's basically stinging yourself on purpose um to address a lot of things, um, but arthritis is a big one that there's actually good research on that shows that it is an anti-inflammatory, which seems counterintuitive when you look at the <laughs> swollen hands that people love to post, but it acts as an anti-inflammatory. Wow. So it has a, a lot of other 
um, uses, but I'm sure we'll get into that. But that's how we sauntered into beekeeping. So without any sort of knowledge of it, we now had two hives and off we went. This is my favorite kind of story because here you are. What were you both doing before this? So my background's nursing. So I was working, I think at the time I was working for the Hope Spring Cancer Support Center and he owned an electrical distribution company. Neither of us lived on a farm, worked on a farm. I had a dog. That was it. <laughs> what did your friends and family think? You're we like, we're going to, we're going to keep bees. This is we, we're, this is what we do now. I think they were as stunned as we were. <laughs> yeah. But the, the reality is I think I spent my, the whole two day course at the university of Guelph, putting my chin back up off my lap because it was so interesting. And it just felt like he was opening this world that was so engrossing. And that's what we've, kind of done to all our friends and family ever since is kind of opened that world. And we, we have a joke when we meet new people at dinner parties and that sort of thing of you need to let us know when to stop because otherwise the new people will just keep asking questions and it can take over the whole evening. That sounds fun to me. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Well, as I say, it's a completely different world than most of us live in and it is completely fascinating and engrossing and, and it goes into science, it goes into art, it goes into food, it goes into health, so many different disciplines that you can access it by. So yeah, it kind of never ends. And talk about like a misunderstood creature of our world. Totally. I mean, how many people have I met who like don't seem to even know the difference between a wasp and a bee, which... From what I understand, they're not even related. Wait, are they different? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they are related way up the the uh, the genealogy, if you will, but quite a far ways. So one of the one of the uh, most fun things I get to do with beekeeping is what I call bee school. So my sister is an elementary school used to be an elementary school teacher just outside Ottawa, and she said. I'm not teaching the insect segment this year. You come teach it, which of course I'm the nurse in the family. She's the teacher, but I put together a little PowerPoint presentation based on what she told me the curriculum requirements were. And then I brought a full frame of honey so the kids could feel what, you know, a couple of pounds of honey in a frame feels like and the wax and the smoker and all sorts of hands-on stuff. And they got a taste of honey as part of the, uh, the talk. And it was fascinating. And this was a senior kindergarten class. So that was back again, 2013. And I have probably done, I've spoken to thousands of kids at this point now. I think right before the pandemic, I think I did 50 schools. And some of those schools I'm doing anywhere between two and four classes. So there's a real interest. The teachers love it. It's usually like the littles, uh, senior kindergarten, junior to grade four at max. But um, they always, part of my talk is always the difference between bees and wasps so that I create these little ambassadors that go out to every picnic. And if it's around their food, the kids are supposed to put their hands on their hips and say, that's not a bee, it's a wasp. And they are, you know, the little experts at the picnic. Catherine, you're changing the world here. <laughs> you are. Well, that's where it starts. Nothing changes the world like a determined <laughs> six-year-old. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> You know, my grandparents kept bees and um, for themselves. They didn't, uh, you know, sell it. It was just for their for their own use. And I just have this vision of they had a beautiful property and their, their garden was raised. And um, I just have this vision of we weren't allowed to get too close, but they were dressed in, in my little six-year-old mind, dressed in head to toe, from head to toe in white. And they had this odd machine that made this squeaky noise and, you know, smoke would billow out of it. And, yeah. you know, then later we'd have honey. Like yeah. this, it, it was just a, such a mystery to me. We weren't allowed near it. You know, they didn't probably didn't want us to get hurt or mess with it yes. more than anything else at that age. Yeah. But um, I have this sort of very romantic vision of what that was like. What's it like keeping these bees? You go from these two hives to... Mm -hmm what you have now. There's actually a term that people use in beekeeping called bee time. There's a book written about it that when you walk into that field, it's kind of like unplugging time. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because there's a lot of visual activity, but there's also the smell of it. There's also certainly the reality that you could be opening a hive that's not in the mood to have you in there, which I did two days ago. I'm sorry. They let me know in no <laughs> uncertain terms and still have to go back and finish them up. But anyway, um, and it is completely engrossing in all your senses. And when you lift that lid, you have 50 to 60,000 creatures moving around in front of you. Visually, it's engrossing. You've got the smell of the wax and the honey that is so soothing um, and the propolis. And it's it's you just kind of, okay, what's next? It's very, if you want to talk about getting into the present moment, beekeeping does that for you. It kind of grabs you by both the shoulders and throws you into the present moment. And 
right there, that's relaxing for our minds to just be doing one thing. I had a young beekeeper, we sell beekeeping equipment, so we help a lot of people get in into the hobby. And she was saying it was so wonderful because I realized even if I wanted to check my phone, she was wearing gloves, I couldn't because I didn't want to get sticky all over my phone, so I couldn't be distracted. So um, I think there are a lot of people who talk the romantic story of my grandfather, and it, it's it's so, you know, in the shrouded of the history, mm-hmm. whereas right now there are so many people getting into it. I think I joke that if you didn't build a deck or get, become a sourdough export through the pandemic, you became a beekeeper. Became We've got a, a lot of new beekeepers. <laughs> And it's, I think it's really neat that more people are learning. You can have one in your backyard in a neighborhood like this. And most of your neighbors will never actually know because you have bees, hopefully, in your flowers all the time. But it's, um, you know, in an era when people are interested in where their food comes from and putting their, putting their, you know, walking their talk and and, um, wanting to have an impact on the environment, you can in this relatively small way. Well, let's talk about that quickly too. I mean, uh, like a lot of local chefs are starting mm. to keep bees on site right. and are you involved with some of those? Yes. So yeah. we've got bees this year on the Walper Hotel in Kitchener and uh, yeah, they're super excited. So I was contacted by Nicole, their chef, and I'm, I'm going there after this to check on, they'll definitely get honey, but I've got uh, some frames in there that she'll get honeycomb, mm. so she'll be able to have those on charcuterie boards and all sorts of, of fun things. So again, that's one of the avenues in is through the food. So one of the ways that we went with it is I have a local um, chocolate shop. I used to do them myself, but the interest is too big now, and we make honey caramels that are covered in chocolate. They're insanely good. I want one now. I know. <laughs> Next podcast. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> that should be an entry fee. Please bring your wares. <laughs> There's uh, bees on uh, Conestoga Mall's roof as well. Yeah. And I, how does, I, I've actually been on the roof of Conestoga Mall. There's nothing up there except it's a, it's a roof. And um, how does that work in terms of they're, they're not, I guess they're not around anything mm-hmm. that they can pollinate. So what are they doing up on the roof? That's a good question. So bees easily fly three to five kilometers for their forage. If they can't find anything, they'll go up to 10 kilometers. So they really um, are agents of finding forage and they will go out in all directions and then they come back. Have you heard about a waggle dance that bees do? I have not heard this. Waggle dance. You need to go on YouTube and look at waggle dance. So basically, if a bee goes out and finds a food source, this is the way that she'll come back and tell the other foragers about what she's found so that they can find it. So usually if it's, if it's over, I think it's over half a kilometer away, it's a figure eight um, shape that they do. The middle of the eight, the angle of it is the direction compared to the sun. The length, I know, blow your mind. <laughs> the length of the line is the distance. So she's giving you the GPS coordinates for the direction compared to the sun, doesn't matter if it's a cloudy day like this, they've got infrared so they can see no matter, ultraviolet, I always forget, Um, and the exact distance, whether it's 1.2 or 3.6 kilometers. She's told them that, and then how many times she does the figure eight pattern and how much she's waggling, so they'll shake, that gives the indication of, is this like one apple tree, it's kind of nice, or oh my God, I found a whole orchard, everybody's gotta go, kind of excitement. So there's, a, there's a, an excitement level message on their GPS coordinates as well. Guys, I'm a bee idiot. I did not know. Are you teaching the children this and oh, they know it? Yes. We actually I need get, to take your class, we Catherine. Get our, we do the waggle dance, actually. <laughs> Depending on the younger kids, I get them to get up and do their waggle dance because they need those. This is breaks. amazing. Right. And that's just the, like, really, the... I, I, it's going to be no problem for me to keep talking. Oh, great. Um, because uh, because it seems like every time you talk about a certain piece of bees, there's another thing that's just crazy fascinating. Yeah. I visited uh, several farms in our community, and uh, they had hives. But I noticed, like, so you go to Floridale Produce, and there's Stuart Horst, and he does basically, him and his family do everything on that farm mm-hmm. to make Elmira's own tomatoes and all everything else. But the one thing I noticed with every farm is not one of those farmers we're looking after the hives. Somebody came right. from elsewhere. And I remember in, in Stuart Horst's case, he was like, yeah, I don't do that, right, kind of thing. Um, what is it that's keeping these farmers from taking care of that one part of the farm? Is it just kind of like it's such an an expertise kind of skill that they just, I, I know and I know how to take care of my farm, we're going to do this, but I'm going to call in the expert to take care of the beehives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, I know of more farmers now that I've gotten into beekeeping, and I think possibly some of it is they just have so much in the day to do with what they're actually growing. To another extent, it is a whole field of knowledge. And while every once in a while we have somebody who shows up to get bee equipment and they literally have not looked at anything, which makes me nervous and I, I try and help them out in terms of access to resources. Like I shouldn't come and get a hive like kit not today. tomorrow. <laughs> right, because I, had, I knew nothing. Right. So it should be some level of education before you come out and try this. Well, do you look up how to take care of a dog? You do. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> and you got 50 to 60,000 stinging dogs now <laughs> in a box. <laughs> so it would be good to have a sense of what they're doing. And, yeah. and for the most part, the role of the beekeeper is just to keep ahead of them in terms of what they're naturally going to do. So you don't need to teach them to sit and stay and take something off the couch. You need to make sure that they have enough space to grow so that they're less likely to swarm. You need to... Unfortunately, now we need to be more mindful of diseases bees can get and take a look at those sorts of things. You need to make sure that there aren't skunks and mice that are really annoying them. And you've got a grumpy hive that is then going to be grumpy to the beekeeper and other people. So there is a little bit of knowledge that's needed. It's not a big time commitment, um, but I think probably for the most part, it's just farmers are busy enough with the 9,000 things they need to do. And um, and then there are people like me who are, you know, have their little traveling kit. And so I'm going to see two, two different hives today that we manage outside of our yards. And um, perfect world for me is if somebody involved in that organization gets interested and I can coach them so that's what's happening in one of my locations and then they gradually take over and I'm their mentor and I can back off and not have to drive all the time but otherwise um, yeah there are people who that's their thing is they go and and do pollination services so the the hive may not actually even live there they may bring the hive in for the flowering time and then pull it out so why would skunks and mice be poking around? And what else would be would be bothering bees? And why would they be bothering bees? Yeah. So skunks uh, like the protein of bees. So they will scratch at the front of a box and the bees come out. They get in the hair of the skunk and they'll pick them off, roll them and eat them. So what you do as a beekeeper is you lift your hive up a little higher so that the skunk has to get up and expose her belly. And then when she does her scratchy scratch, they sting her in the belly and she's not as happy with that outcome. So less likely to. Or there are people who will put um, a nail mat out in front of their hive. They just have to be careful. They're not one of those poor beekeepers who forget they put a nail mat and do their own <laughs> foot treatment. Skunk- oh, I, I see these rodents want the honey. So bees, yeah. uh, skunks actually want to eat the bees. Want the bee. Oh, they yeah. want the bees, yeah. yeah. Mice like the nice warm space in the winter because the bees mm-hmm. will not hibernate. They cluster up into a ball, yeah. but those corners of the hive are nice and warm. And yes, there's some little nibbles in there, mm-hmm. but they will go in there and and uh, nest over the winter and then try and have their babies in the spring before the hive expands because the hive will kill them or chase them out. You would think the skunks would be like, mm, we know not to mess with those bees you would think (laughs) well and (laughs) nothing that we have to consider but bears Mm -hmm. and i remember again part of our first course and our teacher said everybody loves that image of winnie the pooh with his little paw you know and he said the bears are not going into the hive for the honey they're going in for the protein so that is the all the larvae there are thousands of larvae in there that aren't going anywhere and it's a nice concentrated source of them so all those stings in the face the honey's a nice gravy but really what he's going she's going for is all that larva mm, interesting so. i see yeah mm-hmm. i was like Pooh's such a smart little I bear know. i'd get the honey too <laughs> what about environmental hazards you know for bees this is a big topic for yeah. sure and i'm even thinking of things like um i know my uh you know 83 year old father-in-law We'll try and pollinate his own garden if he doesn't think it's happening. Mm. Uh, is this good? Is this bad? Sure. I saw someone with a tattoo. It, had a, it was a bee in there. It said, if we go, we're taking you with us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's just true, right? Yes, definitely. Well, the, everybody knows that line that a third of the foods that we eat are pollinated by some level of creature. So honeybees get a lot of the PR for this, but obviously it's bats and moths and flies and ants and you know wasps and there are all different kind of creatures hummingbirds of course and butterflies are top of the list but all those creatures do the pollination so we have 400 indigenous species of bees in ontario 800 in canada honeybees are not from north america they're from europe they came over in the 1600s and we didn't have honey until then so they've been um 
you know, adopted. Everybody's thrilled they came over. But we have tons of pollinators that do all that job otherwise and have, you know, for the all our all our vegetables that we ate before they showed up. So there's definitely an environmental impact that they're wonderful at doing. They say you get a 30% increase in your garden if you have a hive close by because it will get so well pollinated. So one of the farms that we've just been on for a couple of years, he has a bunch of apple trees and he's been commenting on the different amount of apples that are showing up because Amazing. he gets all this crazy pollination from 10 hives. I guess it has to do with the queen. Uh, like a hive can just kind of leave. Yes. Right? Um, so... How does that work? I, I, I've spent time listening to beekeepers talk about queen rearing, which seems very complicated. It is. And also, <laughs> um, I find that a really uh, upsetting that somebody could be looking after a hive and that hive just picks up and leaves. So right. what happens there? Yeah. So the hive has, as you say, one queen. Um, so the makeup of a hive is a mated queen. 50 to 60,000 bees, 85% of them, they're the female worker bees that do all the worker jobs. And 15% are the male drone bees that are the genetic material. They don't do any foraging or protecting or managing honey or anything like that. They're genetic material in case they need mating. Hmm. So <laughs> we have to be careful. We don't go into misogyny when one talks yeah. about that sort of thing. But anyway, the queen um, is really not dictating the hive like our mindset of what a queen does really it's more that she has a pheromone that the rest of the bees know how healthy the colony is by how healthy how strong her pheromone is if for example somebody like me forgot to go and put an extra box on top to give them space to put more honey and they got what we call honey bound the congestion in the hive makes it harder for her pheromone to get past. So the bees actually move throughout the hive all, um, all during the day and they pass her pheromone. So everybody can kind of get a check in of, yep, Queenie's good. If it gets so congested that that movement slows down, it's a signal for the hive that we're congested and there's not enough room at the inn. So essentially it's how a hive has a baby. So the queen... Um, or the hive starts preparing what we call queen cells, which is a female worker bee that's fed differently. She's fed a ton of royal jelly. And instead of growing up to be a worker bee that lives six weeks, she grows up to be a bee that's almost twice the size, one and a half ish, and can live up to four years just because of what she's fed. So I always tell the kids about how important it is to what you eat. Mm -hmm. um, so three days before one of those new queen bees is born, the hive will start to swarm. So half of those bees, around 30,000, there's no exact number, will take out front and create this little cyclone, which is really interesting to stand in the middle because they're not aggressive, they're not coming at you, but cyclone of bees, and eventually the queen will come out and they will take off for something that's about 15 feet-ish in the area and hang on it. So everybody knows what a swarm looks like and you know people get them on their car and whatever. So. All they've come up with at this point is we need to leave. They haven't actually got, we're going to the Walper. There's or no we're plan. Going where. Yeah. <laughs> so the remainder, uh, so we'll talk about what's left. So you've got those queen cells. In three days, one of those queens will emerge first. She will smell the pheromone of the other queens and they start to pipe. You can actually Google that on YouTube as well and hear piping queens. She will quickly go throughout the hive and kill sting and kill all the other emerging queens so that she's first and she can actually smell which ones are more close because they're not necessarily laid on the same day and she'll sting them in order of age so that she's killing you know so now she's the new queen but she's not mated so she's got to go off and um, she does a couple of mating flights comes back and then pretty much from then on she doesn't leave the hive um, she will lay her body weight in eggs every day, 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. She starts in about February. She gets a Christmas break, so she kind of wraps up around September-ish. Um, but she lays her body weight in eggs a day and will repopulate that hive back up. So that's what happens to the bees that stayed. The, the bees that leave, they now have to find a new home. So they send off bees madly in all directions, as they do when they're looking for forage, looking for something that is kind of the dimensions of a hive. So it's got um, that kind of space, and um, it's empty. It'd be great if it was dry, all those kinds of things. It'd be, they love something that would be around 10 to 15 feet high. That's what they'd normally do in a tree. 
So they're going to go and find these spaces and then come back. So the hive that's out there is sent bees flying off madly in all directions. They will then come back and tell the other bees what they've found. So there's the swaggle dance again. And so they're going to say what direction and how far away and how excited they are by it, by this waggle dance. So they have about 5% of the swarm hanging on that tree that is going and doing this job. Then they come back and because you're really excited about yours, I'm going to check out yours and you're going to check out hers. It's of course all females that are doing this. And we kind of get second opinions. And then if I come back from yours and yours is way better than mine, I change my waggle dance to dance for yours. So it gets to the point where we've done this second opinion and there's a quorum and now we decide, well, you know, the one that Sarah found, that's the best one. We start to wake up the body of the swarm and the queen is tucked in the middle being guarded and we take off because you've given us the GPS coordinates. We move in, we start building wax. She starts looking for a place to lay. The system starts all over again. Amazing. Fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. Marshall, let's take a moment to hear from this week's sponsor, the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. Today, we're going to stop by Cloverleaf Farms. Okay, I'm uh, Hilde Scheidt from Cloverleaf Farms out of New Hamburg. My son was trained in Germany as a butcher in Heidelberg. And then when he came home, he decided he wants to open his own business. That was in 1984. So we've been in business for quite a while. Our own production, we have some German butchers that do our recipes, so we're in luck. At Cloverleaf Farms, they make their own schnitzel and they make their own smoked chops with their special recipe. They make lots of kebabs and they make lots of sausage. Oktoberfest, honey garlic, garlic and Italian. That's all our own recipe. We make oodles of pepperettes, different kinds. Also our own recipe. Lots of goodies, breakfast sausage, beef jerky is one of our best sellers as well. People love a beef jerky. So we're kind of happy to do what we're doing right now. We do have a lot of customers that have not been here in a long, long time. And they're from Barrie, Niagara, uh, Toronto, Milton, Hamilton, London. Windsor. And Hilda is still making her delicious sauerkraut recipe that my family loves. I still make that at the store. And our special sauerkraut is with uh, bacon and onion and it's called gourmet and again uh, I was there yesterday at the store and I worked there for quite a while to make some more because uh, even though it's summertime people still love it with their sausage or with our schnitzel and um, but now comes into the Oktoberfest kind of era soon and so I guess I'll have to do it twice a week not just once a week soon as the market, uh, Tuesday market is finished, that's till the 14th of September. I guess I'll be doing a little bit more sauerkraut or whatever they need me to do. Because I also cook soups at our store. I make the soups. So yeah, it's going to be a busy time and I love it. And of course, a market favorite for many families are their pepperettes. Well, it's a kind of snacking little and all our pepperettes are gluten free beside that. And, uh, you know, instead of having chips or something, people, you know, fulfill their taste or their um, need with uh, pepperettes. And we have so many kinds. We have teriyaki, we have turkey, we have honey garlic, uh, sweet and spicy, we have uh, just a mild. So don't forget to visit Hilda at Cloverleaf Farms in the main market building of the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. Can we, can we back up and pretend that I'm six, Marshall as well, yeah. and and just sort of take us through like what is in the hive? What is, what is, what are the parts? Sure. Because we're hearing so much information from you and, and sort of what their plans are. And these are basically geniuses now we know. Right. Um, what does everything look like in there? Right. And and as well, I remember you saying how like the, the bee, the worker bee's life is like they have a role at here and then that role changes, that mm -hmm. role changes. Exactly. Then they do this and then they die. They work their entire life. Right. Yeah. So... I, I love telling people it's not like the Seinfeld movie. As cute as that movie was, I actually haven't been able to finish it because there were so many inaccuracies. I will someday. But the whole premise that it was the male 
that was doing all these jobs. Well, we know in a beehive, the male has one job. So it would have been an R-rated movie. He couldn't have made it. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And also he wanted to pick his job. And as you've said, no, they actually have multiple jobs. Unless they're the queen or the drones, they have multiple jobs. So uh, inside the hive, the first thing you would notice is it's completely dark. So they like dark. So as soon as I take the lid off, that's making a huge impact on their atmosphere. They're not bothered by it, but it alerts them to, you know, somebody just ripped the roof off the house and uh, we want to make sure that that everything's going to stay good in here. But if you um, go in the hive, pretty much at the beginning, you're going to meet guard bees. So they know the smell of our family. So we have a family smell as a hive of what our queen smells like. So right away, there's kind of a gate guardian there that's going to make sure that you're part of us. They say that if a a bee from another hive wants to come in, if she's got a good dose of honey or pollen, they'll let her in. So as always, bring good gifts and you get let in. (laughs) Um, Drones are the only ones that can come from different hives. Drones can kind of, if you will, cross-pollinate between different hives. So there's a a good genetic um, reason for that in terms of having diversity. Inside the hive, you're going to come in in the middle um, bottom box, if you will. There's about a football size tucked right in the middle. That's what we call brood. So those are baby bees. The, uh, the color of them is a little more beige than the honey, which is whiter. And uh, really, those are the queen's work of laying those eggs. And they'll, they're born in 21 days for worker bees. If it's going to be a drone bee, they tend to do them a little more on the outside and they look like an eraser head popped up a little bit. So you can tell it's a, the drone is a bigger bee because he's out flying all the time trying to find a, a virgin queen. So, you know, he's got to have more, more wing power. He's, he takes 24 days to be born. So you're going to see that kind of football cluster of what we call brood in the middle frames, in the middle of the hive spatially. <clears throat> and then around the edges, are you're going to find food resources. So there'll definitely be honey in its various stages, and there'll also be pollen. So those are the two main food sources that bees are bringing back in. They're bringing nectar back, but they're processing it. So as I say to the kids, if you stuck your finger in a flower and tasted the nectar, you'd say, you know what, Catherine, this is not what you gave me at the taster stick a minute ago, because nectar is 80% water. If you open your jar of honey and test it for water content, it's around 15 to 17%. So similar to the process of maple syrup, you need to dry it off. They don't have boilers in their hive, so they use wing power. So they fan to dry off the nectar. The other thing that's different about the nectar is uh, when the bee takes nectar out of a flower, she puts it into like a honey crop. So it's not her stomach. The the nasty thing people say that honey is bee vomit. Mm -hmm. Eh, Not so much. Um, They have like a carrying case specifically for honey. They have enzymes in there. So when she comes back from foraging, she passes the honey to a worker or a house bee that's sitting at the front door who puts it in her honey crop with her enzymes. It gets passed numerous times between bees until it finally gets put into a cell. So it's not nectar anymore. It's got all these layering of enzymes, which is one of the things that makes it a health product. So now we've dried it off. Um, There's some bees that do that. And then there are some bees that they're at that stage, as you said, depending on their age, they emit wax. So they call it sweating wax. So at a specific age, I think it's 11 to 13 days. They, the, if you look on their belly, uh, well, those, those stripes that they have black and brown, cause they're not black and yellow. Those are the wasps. They actually are sections of their body. So they sweat these tiny little flakes of wax. So they will do that and then grab them with their little teeny paws and shape them into all those great hexagons that are always the exact same size. Cause they're little engineers and they're creating the space for the honey to come in. And then finally, when it's dried off, they put a lid on. And because of that, your honey will stay at the same moisture content, which means that it's good forever. So honey actually does not have an expiration date. I remember when I was putting our first honey in our first um, store, Relish, um, here in Kitchener and uh, their cooking studio. And uh, she looked up at me and she said, okay, so what, what's the expiration on them? I said, yeah, two, mm, 3,000 years. <laughs> and she went, oh my gosh, yeah. right. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, if, as long as you're okay, if it eventually crystallizes, your honey jars are good forever. So, so that's the nice thing about it. Um, so beyond that, um, you've got pollen stores, so that's their protein. So nectar is their carbohydrate, it's their sugars, and pollen is their protein. 
protein that has supposedly more or pollen has more protein per gram than beef. Wow. Which you're probably not going to have a six ounce piece of pollen, um, but it's got all the essential vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. It's a superfood. So that's what we take in our house for a vitamin is a spoonful of pollen. Beyond that, you're just going to get more honey and pollen. So they've got their kind of capacity of, of, um, of brood that they're going to keep that keeps that turnover because as we said, in the summertime, bees live six weeks. So there's got to be enough babies in the nursery coming up so that they're going to replace all of those. And there's going to be attrition, right? Bees that get lost, caught in the rain, eaten, smacked by a car, whatever happens to, to them. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Hopefully not. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what the inside of it looks like. Uh, the other thing that's neat that most people don't know about bees is something called propolis. So bees will go to resin trees and bring the resin back again, process it with enzymes and they coat the entire inside of the hive with it for their, um, twofold reason. One is it hardens back into a resin. So bees don't like things that move. And so this is literally going to cement things into place. So the first thing that any beekeeper needs is what we call our hive tool. It's basically a small crowbar. And when you go in, you need to crack open hives because they propolize is the term they use and seal everything into place. So they are sealing also any holes if, if it was, you know, a box that, that had a hole in it or a natural space so that ants and other creatures that might come in can't just wander in. The other component to propolis though, is it's antimicrobial. So it's antiviral, fungal, bacterial. So this is off gassing this antimicrobial air into a space that is loaded with sugar and rife for, you know, viruses and bacteria, et cetera, and babies. So that's like their HEPA filter in there cleaning out the space. So again, as a beekeeper, you go out, you're breathing this hive air and, um, we can talk about it later, but there are actually people who in some countries will come and breathe hive air for asthma, COPD, emphysema, and, um, making use of this same property that the bees just know about. So that's another thing inside the hive. I know it goes on. It gets more and more interesting as you go. I can't remember the last time I learned so much in one, in one <laughs> sitting. I'm loving this. It's very fun when I do my bee schools because yeah. inevitably by the end when I'm, you know, I always leave time for extra questions. It's almost like the teacher wants to push the kids aside and, and talk to me for <laughs> half an hour Oh yeah, because there's, you know, I don't talk generally about all the mating stuff and I try and not to talk too much about the dying mm-hmm. parts depending on the age group, but equally fascinating and uh and yeah the teachers always want to get their their questions answered too yeah. i found uh backyard honey at charles quality meats yes you did on weber street and uh for it to get on the shelf there so i have visited uh Ackroyd's honey in Terra, ontario yes and i've i've been in their building where there's there's equipment and it's it's not super high-tech equipment it doesn't look super overly complicated but it's it's big and and you can see how the honey is uh, gets from the comb to the to the jar. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your setup like? You start beekeeping and at some point you go, hey, we can start putting this in jars and start selling right. it. Uh, how do you how do you get to that place where you're ready to? Okay, let's sell this honey yeah and it's funny you mentioned it's not super high tech but it doesn't have to because they're doing all that for you yeah the bees are doing that part right <laughs> they do part of it yeah uh, they do the important part right really. right uh so it's interesting actually we have on our label it says it used to say putting local bees to work and a girlfriend said you know it sounds a little indentured servitude could we just have local bees yeah. at work so that's what our label says now <laughs> that is a they, nice way to say it they do it they're gonna do it frankly whether i'm there or not right um i'm just making sure that they do it in my backyard so in terms of this is one of the things i love about beekeeping is you can get into it and completely diy it you can make your own frames you can you can um, extract the honey in your bathtub. You can, you can do a lot of it out of your, out of your own creativity, or you can come and, and get some things that are pre-done and, uh, try and, and avail yourself of some of that, or you can go totally tech. So 
we have woodworkers that build their own stuff. Most people generally buy their woodwork you know, equipment. But in terms of extracting it, the, uh, the main way people do it is you have something that's called an uncapping fork. So you've got a frame, that what we call fully capped honey. You want to get the lids off the jars, if you will. So it's just a lifter. Uh, you can get heated knives that will just kind of slice the top off them. And then what most people end up doing is getting some level of an extractor. So it's basically a centrifuge. So you put it in. You can have a manual one, which if you have more than two hives, you're going to turn into Popeye with all the couple hundred pounds of honey you're going to get. Or you have an electric one, and it will spin a couple times both ways. Basically, it just throws all the honey down, and you've got a spigot, which we call a honey gate at the bottom. You're going to have a filter there that will take off any bits of wax that are in there. Um, you could have little other bits of things you're going to filter it out but it leaves the pollen in it it's not a it's not a micro filter and then you can put it in jars from there so it's it's very no tech if people are for example large large scale they may be doing pasteurizing so pasteurizing is heating it to a certain temperature right away you're killing all those wonderful enzymes and all that great stuff that's in it that makes it such a health food product but you're also decreasing the amount of um, crystallization they're going to have so for people who are putting their honey in big grocery stores lots of volume and they don't want to be pulling um, crystallized jars off generally they will pasteurize it so um, yeah you can you can you can do it any any way that kind of suits you and usually you get told by your bees which way because most people think, oh, you know, I'll have a hive and I'll have five jars of honey. No. Your first year, you can end up with 50 to 100 pounds of honey. Your second year, you can have two to 400 pounds. We have a, a, a friend who beekeeps out in Alberta and they have canola fields. And he really is disappointed if his hives don't make 400 pounds of honey. Wow. So... It's a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot. So we can see out into Sarah's backyard here. So when we talk about backyard beekeeping, um, are there, there must be a some misunderstanding amongst neighbors in terms of if they can see what you're doing. I heard you say earlier that you can keep a hives and nobody really knows. But if you look out in Sarah's backyard here, you could imagine. So I know what the setup would somewhat look like having been at um, apiaries. And, uh, and then you come out in your full suit, right? And you or not? not. <laughs> okay, you're, su you're suitless. Definitely. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the ones I've seen, everybody has a suit on, and uh, and up comes the lid, and there's bees swarming, and uh, I could imagine that some neighbors being like, "What the heck is this?" Right. Right next door. Yeah. Isn't that what some backyard beekeepers have to deal with? Is that that misunderstanding of what they're doing and, and concerns that maybe are not founded. Sure. Yeah. So I think there's always, that's why I love doing the B school is just to get the education component out there because most people don't know the difference between something that's flying around their food at their barbecue, which is always going to be a wasp. Yeah. Bees don't eat our foods. They don't eat cooked foods. They don't like the sugary drinks. If you get stung on the lip because something went in your beer, that was a wasp. It's never going to be a bee. You hear but, that people? Yes. <laughs> the only time you get stung by a bee is if maybe she's drinking some water off the ground because there's dew in the morning and you step on her because I love to be barefoot or you're you know going somewhere and her path flies into my hair and she's not really good at finding her way out of curly hair so every once in a while I'll get stung that way but generally you don't get stung by a bee unless you you're asking done for it yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I mean when I go into a hive I generally don't wear gloves if I'm if I know the hive and the only time I get stung is if I've moved my finger and I squash her mm -hmm. well my size compared to hers I'd hit back too so that's her only defense but bees die when they sting so they actually are predisposed not to whereas wasps have a smooth stinger um, the bees are barbed so that actually hooks in them and eviscerates them essentially wasps um there's a smooth stinger and so she can sting and turn around and sting you and sting all of us and come back and do it again tomorrow so they mm -hmm. are they are and they're territorial and all these sorts of things that make them little codgery things <laughs> however out back to sarah's backyard here so if you actually take the lid off you would have a few flying around but your your use of the word swarm i'll take back yeah um, i was wondering that <laughs> you won't if, uh, if i took it off maybe on a what, crazy stormy day yeah then i would have a little more response because they don't want all that moisture in the hive and they need to defend yeah but if i took the lid off um put a little smoke in so that they have a it Basically, smoke masks their fear pheromone. So if I get stung, they release a fear pheromone, or if they're just signing an alert. If I put a little smoke, it basically washes that away. 
So I'll put a little smoke in, take the lid off. I might have a few come up, but really there's not that much activity. What um, the other thing that I will mention in terms of a neighborhood hive, most neighborhoods around here, there is a complaint based bylaw. So you have to have, according to this complaint based bylaw, you have to have 30 meters from your beehive to your property line. Well, in our place when we lived in Waterloo, it was on our property line. There were no 30 meters. It's basically a way for them to be able to enforce if there's an issue with mm -hmm. a beehive. Mm -hmm. It's a complaint based bylaw. If you talk to your neighbors and they're fine with it, or as some of our beekeepers do, they've got big trees and the neighbors just don't know, then, and, and they wouldn't because they're going to have 40 more bees in their flowers and their flowers look great. And that's the impact they get. Or again, gifts, everyone. You give the neighbors honey. <laughs> I'll definitely do that. Yes. And all the kids on our street would come over and I would do my bee school in the backyard with them sitting in like little, so cool. little uh, ducks on a row. Um, and it was great. But other than that, if nobody complains, they're not enforcing your beekeeping skills or anything like that. They are really just making sure that if somebody's got a fear or uh, an anaphylactic issue that they you know, don't feel is, is safe or, or just feel uncomfortable with it, that they can actually make that and act that. But it's extremely rare that that happens. I hear you, uh, everything that you have to say, Catherine, is, is so respectful of bees and uh, it sounds like you're doing things very naturally. So I have a weird question about ethics, mm. right? What's the answer to that? Should we be taking this honey from the bees, mm -hmm. right? How, how does that work? Yeah. So it's always an interesting question if I'm selling honey and somebody's a vegan because some sure. vegans don't eat honey and mm -hmm. some do. Some vegans will eat the honey if they know the beekeeper and they know how the hives are kept. So some of the things that... Um, yeah, there's so many different, this is why I love doing intro um, bee chats, I call them, for people who are interested in beekeeping, because I want people before they start to get a sense of what kind of beekeeping do I want to do down the road, because you can you can just keep bees for themselves. Well, even before that, you could just enjoy bees. You could just put flowers out and uh, make the world a better place for bees without keeping them in anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reality is um, we wouldn't be able to have the pollination that we have now if it weren't for beekeepers because certainly in the States, but anywhere where those, there are those massive farms, bees can't survive there because once those almonds are done, there is nothing for them to eat. It's an right. absolute food desert. Right. So they have to truck in the bees and get them out of there before they starve um, when all those blossoms start going. So okay. that's the silliness of our, our farming. Not certainly as anywhere near as much in this region, but in terms of the, the rationale for beekeepers. In terms of um, other ethics, there are people who do organic beekeeping. So that means no plastic in the hive. So those frames that we put in, we put them in, um, it's a plastic base that's coated in beeswax so that the bees take to it more. It makes it so that when I put it in my extractor, it doesn't just flop right out and right. become a holy mess at the bottom of the extractor. So it's easier for me. It also makes sure that they go in the straight lines that I've decided which way we're going, as opposed to sometimes you get these gorgeous waggly um, combs. Beautiful, little hard to take out. Um, so we employ that. There are some people, if they want to be organic, they will either put wax in or they let the bees just put their own wax in that frame. It goes into how we treat the bees in terms of um, chemicals. So we keep all of our hives on three different organic properties. So we can't, even if we wanted to, use anything that's not organic. There are treatments for, there's a parasitic mite that's pretty much in any hive in North America. There are a few pockets where they've kept them out, but pretty much if you have bees, you've got varroa mites. So essentially this is the something that is uh, equivalent to us if you were born with a pancake sized little parasite on you that's draining your blood. For them it's their hemolymph. It makes them more predisposed to just anything, right? If you were giving a pint of blood a day, you would probably get a few more colds. Um, but also it does what things like this do and it puts viruses in. So it can make the bees unwell. So there are treatments that need to be done. Um, you can do mechanical ways of decreasing the varroa. I won't go into those because that's another three hour course. <laughs> um, we have organic treatments that we use that are very readily available. I would say a lot, certainly probably all commercial beekeepers, 99.9, um, and a lot of beekeepers just for ease will use synthetic um, just because that's how they're taught. And uh, so they'll treat their bees with a synthetic chemical. So there are other diseases where people 
used to be very much in the practice of using an antibiotic as a prevention to one specific um, uh, problem called American foul brood. And it gets a lot of buzz, sorry, um, <laughs> because if you get a bad case of American foul brood, there's no coming back from it. You literally have to light your hive on fire, bees and all. It has to just be incinerated, which is horrible. And it's one of these boogie monsters that everybody, every beekeeper knows about burning your hive and American foul brood. But uh, we've been in beekeeping for eight years now, and I think I've heard of two people, maybe, who've had to manage American foul brood. So it's extremely rare. And frankly, as a person with a background in nursing, I don't support preventatively using antibiotics because if you look at the science, it's not a good thing. So um, so there's all sorts of, of ways you can keep bees. Uh, again, you know, some people just want to have them and, and plant lots of plants for them and just allow them to exist. Some people are interested in the pollination, etc., in working the bees. I think for us, uh, the education piece is a huge component for us in terms of all the kids. Um, I do adult chats as well, and then I get to talk about the mating and the dying. Um, and then getting new beekeepers started, because it's a fabulous hobby that is no screen time while you're at it, and is, uh, is I think it's, it, it's enriches people's lives. Um, it, it also deeply connects you to the environment. So I have a lovely beekeeper who, um, when she started, she said, is there a way I can do this without killing a single bee? And there really isn't, unfortunately, with the amount of you, when you go in and pull frames out, one of those 60,000 is bound to be in the wrong place when you put the lid back down. So, um, but other people who just are really devoted to, they want to, um, contribute to the health of the bees in the community and and so that's their passion so it's really great to to hear everybody's stories as to why they get into beekeeping and how it affects them for some people it's not for them the reality is that right now because of our climate and the chemicals in our environment we have a much greater die-off than they used to see. So 30 years ago, overwinter losses were 15 percent, one five. That was typical losses. Now we look at anywhere between 50 and 70 percent. So we had a beekeeper that I knew that they have 10,000 hives. That spring, they had 5,000 hives survive. So that is the chemicals in our environment, the amount of these varroa mites, um, the lack of forage because we keep paving everything, and you know we put a nice perfect green lawn out there and take get get those dandelions out as fast as possible. So it's a food desert. All your golf courses, food deserts, and so we're not really creating an environment that sustains life. And the bees are what they call a sentinel species. They do that orbit around their hive and bring back from all these different sources. So if you do a diagnosis on that hive, you will get a report card in terms of the health of that area, in terms of the chemicals they accumulate in a hive, in terms of you know how, how far they've had to go to forage, all those sorts of things. Your hive is kind of your canary in a coal mine in terms of how you're doing as a community. No pressure. <laughs> Hey all, thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung.